Welcome to The Advocate, your Sunday reminder that important conversations are among the necessary tools for a sinner society. I will be talking about the world in 2022 and the lessons and hopes for 2023. Hussein Olajuwaju will be talking about the new cashless, CBN cashless policies, taking a critical look at their effects. Victor Yukiri will be talking about East is fast becoming up nuts. Today, expect a mist of seriousness, laughter and jabs. We will be back after this break. Welcome back. The world in 2022 and the lessons and hopes for 2023. Over the last 12 months, the world has experienced several moments that has challenged the course of history and has led to defining moments of a revolutionary in outlook. As important or enormous as these events were, the lessons learned can never be overemphasized, especially as we hope for a greater world in 2023. Some of these major events and lessons are as those. In January, the COVID-19 pandemic, the number of vaccinations administered worldwide exceeds 10 billion. China, France, Russia and the United Kingdom and the United States, all five permanent members of the United Nations Security Council issued a red joint statement affirming that a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. In February, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the European Union, the United States and the Allies commit to removing Russia banks from SWIFT payment system as well as imposing measures on the Russian Central Bank and further restrictions on Russia elites. These and other sanctions fueled a financial crisis in Russia. In March, the National Assembly of Hungary elected their former Minister for Family Affairs, Katalia Novak, as President of Hungary in a 137 to 51 vote indicating the strong value driven politics. Also, the global death toll from COVID-19 surpassed 6 million. In April, the United, votes, the United Nations votes by a 93 to 24 to suspend Russia from the Human Rights Council, with 58 countries abstaining. In June, at least 50 persons were killed in a dual mass shooting in Owo, Nigeria. Also in June, primary elections were conducted in Nigerian political parties. In August, the 2022 Kenya general elections, William Ruto was elected as Kenyan fifth president. Pakistan declared a, a climate catastrophe and appealed for international assistance as death toll from the recent flooding in the country exceeded 1,000, the world's deadliest flood since 2017. In September, Elizabeth Truss was appointed prime minister of the United Kingdom after winning the election but later resigned an act of responsible leadership. Queen Elizabeth II died at the age of 96, and her son, Charles III, succeeded her, succeeded her as king. The 2022 Swedish general elections was held to elect all 349 seats of the rich duck. Prime Minister Magdalena Andersen resigned after her center-left bloc narrowly losses in a, to a bloc of the right-wing parties. 176 seats to 173. Anderson is succeeded as Prime Minister by Uf Kestesen in October. Burkina Faso military junta was overthrown by the country's second coup of the year, led by Army Captain Ibrahim Traoré, raising concerns of political instability. The death of 22-year-old Masha Amini, following her arrest by Iran's morality police, the Guardian Patrol, over wearing an improper hijab, in violation of the Iran's mandatory hijab law on women, sparked an ongoing series of protests and civil unrest against the government of Iran. In October, Elon Musk completed his $44 billion acquisition of Twitter in a bid to promote free speech. In November, the world population reached 8 billion mark. Nigeria's former president, Olusegun Obasanjo, successfully negotiated a permanent ceasefire between the conflicting Ethiopian government and the Tigray region on behalf of the African Union. In December, the Congress of Peru removed President Pedro Castillo from office and arrested him after he tried to dissolve Congress in a coup attempt. President Biden hosts 49 
African head of government, including Nigerian's president, Mohamed Buhari, in the United States African Leaders Summit. My fellow advocates, we have come a long way this year as we prepare for a new year and a new political dispensation. What are your thoughts and hopes, especially on the following? Peace before and during election. Victor, what's your thoughts on peace before and during election? Yeah, quite um, a long read, you know, and um, a lot has happened this year in Nigeria, in Africa as a continent, right? And then, of course, globally. And I love the way you had kick-started, like, the, your script, you know, and which is how do we learn from all of these events? If there's something that life teaches you right, is taking lessons from events. And if we're not able to learn from each of these critical events that you have outlined, there is a good part of it, right? How do we begin to amplify it? There is the, the bad side of it. How, what do we need to do in 2023 to avoid it, essentially? And one of the things event does, or the massive return on investments with events, right, and experiences, essentially, is that it becomes um, an education curve. Now, it depends on how we're able to use that event as a benchmark for making decisions, right? And every single day we're going through these events. I mean, you've read a couple of very key ones that happened globally. However, every single day, you know, people are getting killed. Every single day, you know, things are happening. Nigerians are thriving in foreign countries, right? Again, that also brings me to the angle of how are we telling our stories, right? Um, now, bringing it home back to Nigeria, so one of the biggest event of 2023 would be the elections, right? You know, but how are we telling our story as Nigerians? Because often someone says, if you Google Nigeria, I mean, and put pictures, you're going to find some very <laughs> funny looking things. And when you Google US, or Dubai, right? And you go to the picture segment. Images. You would see, yeah, images, right? You would see some very, very interesting things to behold. So we're not telling our stories. And I pretty much think that it's either we're adamant to learning, right? Or we're not learning enough from all of these events. The new person that is going to steer this ship, right? Or that's going to lead this company called Nigeria right this new person has to take a critical second third third and fifth look at all of these events and ask you know himself and his cabinet what are we going to pick as lessons from this and if we're not able to draw out lessons how then do we drive you know transformation how then do we change behavior and we all know that it is what we do with what we know that creates the outcome in our lives, right? Yeah. So what are Nigerians essentially going to do? What, so if you sit down and ask the young folks, what has NSARS taught you? For some, oh, we fought, we did our luta, we scattered everywhere, you know, we made the government know, we gave them a, a five-point agenda, you know, things like that. But what has it taught you? right at a personal level right at a political level right at a social level and, a, and at a professional level what lessons have we learned from that right maybe things like i was even expecting that somebody actually i was writing a book <laughs> on sarah Soke, okay, but i you know i had to just leave it to i think i've project. seen it you've seen it yeah, right? so you never i was expecting it. that we should have like a a a a follow-up, a sequel to say, how can we to like know, keep to measure what have not even far. like what do we learn from answers? How do we 
engineer i mean i'm sure hussein is on the other side right joining us and he's going to talk you know yeah hussein i was going to ask him uh although just before Hussein, Hussein, i want you to comment on the economy because i know that's your um, area of specializing in economy and the new cbn cashless policies but before then i'd like to hear your thoughts on what do you think about peace before post a uh, pre and post election during and post election what do you think about it what should we do? Just comment on it for like 30 seconds and then you say something about the new CBN cashless policy. What do you think about the economy, the effect on the economy? Who's in? Okay, thank you, Niger. And uh, I can hear Victor speak about some areas. You know, so for me, I want to now read down to a layman language, like a street boy that I have, right? You see, uh, a lot of happenings, just as you clearly stated out, in, around the world, but it's difficult for us to probably due to ideology and not having an open mindset in Nigeria to narrow it down to our own basic understanding. So I, I would like to pick uh, basically two things, which is taking responsibility and taking actions, right? So I, I give you an example. Um, you made mention of like some prime minister resigning due to one or two things they feel they have filled the country conscience. Do we actually have that conscience in Nigeria? You know, that's where we should be looking at. Secondly, you look at uh, happening the likes of uh, uh, Ukraine war, where wheat it affected the production of wheat, not just in Europe, even in Africa. Today, Nigerians see a uh, price of bread increasing like triple triple to like four four. four for example, a bread that you buy for 200 naira now goes for like 600, 900 naira. You wonder why? You think it is the hardship economy of the government policy? Eh, no. It's because we are not growing what we consume. We are buying this, we are depending on this nation, and these nations are having one or two issues, which is giving us the difficulties to even access those raw materials to produce the flowers that we use for making bread. All these things are things that we should be begin to look into taking responsibility. And you know, we should be looking at a country where we we are void of religion and tribal sentiment and see reality as they come and learn from what is happening around the world. When you talk about peace, peace can only happen when a group of people decide to agree on a progressive path. If these same group of people decide to say they want to continue because that's what we have in Nigeria today, in a part where it is just self-centered greediness about protecting their own interests, individual interests. Uh, uh, I, I, I don't want to say this, but I, I feel we we'll still have issue challenging peace because peace is not is not something that we just talk about. It's something that we have to take responsibility and you know act on it. So, in a nutshell, we are having. Uh, Come 2023, an election is coming. I think we should be focusing more beyond uh, uh, the tribal sentiment, the religion sentiment, and what have you. We should be focusing more on what do this candidate have for us? Who is a candidate that has solutions? Who is a candidate that actually see the, the essence beyond tribe and religion to say this is a new direction? These are things that will be identified. It's not what people just want to hear of, uh, I am Muslim, I am a Christian, I'm, I'm from the North, I'm from the South. Let us, truth be told, if today they ask a, a, a typical person from, from the North to say, who oh, will be your candidate? Majority might say, ah, this is my brother from the North. I will prefer to support this person. The South, South and South East, if you ask a typical Igbo man, that, why are you supporting Peter will be, for example? They don't have any major reason, he's my brother. If you ask somebody from Southwest, why are you supporting a, a Tinubu Ah, It is a Minocon, it's somebody from my place. You know, we should live beyond those levels and see reality, skill ourselves up, get a system. We don't have a system. So for us to be able to do this, we have to agree to chart a way forward, a progressive way forward that is standard, you know. It is not based on greed or sentiment. I, I think if we are able to take responsibility, at all level, in terms of decision, in terms of action, in terms of scaling up the system and making the system work, peace is very close to us. Thank you very much, Suleiman, uh, Uzain. 
Um, the, I wanted to hear your thoughts, Zain, on um, the economy with respect to the new cashless policy, you know, as an economist that you are. So what do you think about, you know, there is thought of the, you can hear that the, the, the Senate is actually having a um, debate over this issue of um, should the CBN governor extend, uh, increase the limits of cash uh, withdrawal, and then is he going to bring down our inf uh, inflation rate or something? You know, I want to hear your thoughts on this as an economist that you are. Okay, uh, thank you. So, um, the, the, the details I would like to talk about later, right? But well, in a nutshell, I believe uh, the EPN came about these policies due to necessity. The policy has actually been on ground for the past over 10 years, since 2011, 2012, and uh, they've been strategizing the in day out, right? I, I think on the limit, um, People that are still financially excluded are on the high side. It has to be forced, uh, to be told, because people are naturally reluctant to change. So the limit should be increased a little bit right, to accommodate the acceptability of the policy. But the cashless policy is needed because that's one of the things that can drive economic viability and you know make things work because once at, at any point in time, when you go to a cattle area or somebody, a fuller that is, sell, is selling cow, and you exchange cash for you to get your cow, you are losing data. And this data that you are losing, it doesn't help you to plan an economy. And it even, all this data that you are losing, it also, you know, encourages corruption in one way. Like, like I like give an example. You have a budget that needs to be presented from a, a, by a state governor. Now, who are you budgeting on? You don't even have the data, the accurate data of those people in your state, financial happening in your state. You don't have a full data. So it's either you're under budget or you're over budget. And when you do this, that is not how corruption will not set in because you won't be able to, you know, uh, account very well for what is happening in your environment. So data is very essential. And when you're exchanging cash that you don't have data of such cash is, is a problem. So I, I believe cashless policy is a good, however, that needs to some little redress to make it work. All right, thank you very much. Accessing global economy, Victor, you know, you're always talking about uh, staying at the corner of your home and being in the global economy, in the global world space. You can actually import skills, soft skills, or should you call it hard skills, hard skills, soft skills from the corner of your home or your office. So how can young people access global economy from Nigeria? So, Well, I think it's, um, it boils down to the, um, to the concept of ideas, right? That's even actually the way um, Nigerians, young folks, right, can take, you know, um, go global, essentially. So it is the concept of how do we export something that has the propensity to travel thousands of miles ahead of me, right? How do I build something that solves a problem for someone in Burkina Faso? How do I build something that solves problem for someone in Ukraine, for someone in Canada, for someone in Ecuador, for someone in Argentina, right? And that's for me, that's the idea of, you know, tapping into the global economy. I don't necessarily have to you know, be in the UK to earn pounds, right? My idea, right, depending on how viable and usable and transferable that idea is, I can sit at anywhere in the world and earn in different currencies. That way, I'm tapping into the economy, right? So it's really about taking a helicopter view around problems globally. Every day, there are problems. When we look around, there are problems. In fact, there are, there, there are more problems than human beings. That's even the, There are more problems than you, you mentioned about 8 billion or 8 something. Billion, yeah. There are double of that number in problems, if not triple. So, so every single day, we are dealing with different problems. But the idea is, do we have people with entrepreneurial mindset to spot these problems and say, how can I build something that makes life easier? life better, that improves the quality of life. And then 
how can I ensure that that thing passes the test of universality? Which is how do I take it from my local market and export it to the world? And that's the way young folks in Nigeria listening right now, that's how they can tap into the global economy. Mm, they have to be globally minded and also knowledge savvy. They have to search for knowledge. You, have, you can't be satisfied with the level you are. So I'm still going to come back to you again before I get back to Suleiman, before we conclude. Um, transparent electioneering. We're talking about 2023 election. Mm. 2023 is a new year for we Nigerians, not just new year. It's also a new political era or political dispensation, depending on what the outcome of the election will be like. As we speak now, President Buhari is in the U U.S. with... Uh, um, other 48 other heads of government and yeah. Joe President Biden is going to meet with President Buhari and I think other five other heads of state that are having election next year to discuss um, with their pact with Nigeria with respecting democracy as an institution and mm -hmm. all those things. So how can we ensure transparent electioneering process and also what can you say about the media engagement of political candidates? You know so far, some political candidates are actually engaging with the media uh, very well, uh, print and electronic media, TVs and all this. But there are some other candidates that shy away from public yeah. uh, conversation. If they come, they come, they want to speak to us by proxy. Yeah. And it's kind of causing some sort of controversy, mm. whether it's a thing of incompetence or a thing of pride. Mm. So we want to understand, is it incompetence or pride? Because you can't do as a political candidate, you cannot do without the masses. So you mm. have to speak to the masses. And the only way to engage the masses is through the media. Engage as many as possible. So what do you think about transparency in our electionary process and media engagement by political candidates to ensure a free and fair election? Mm. Good. Good. Great stuff. Fundamentally, imagine a pastor or an imam saying that, oh, I'm a shy person. I don't know how to talk. That's a fundamental skill set needed to even be a pastor or an imam. So if you can't articulate the message from Allah or from God, then you shouldn't be there in the first place, right? So when I hear things like, oh, no, I mean, the pre I see it on Twitter, the president doesn't have to really, or the president that is vying for the office right doesn't really have to be eloquent or things like that and uh, while i understand that it is not the most critical asset required but it should be our minimum when i say minimum basic barrier to entry if you can't even hold a conversation with us you shouldn't have any business being on that seat now i can go be a chief of staff Right. The truth is, <laughs> the chief of staff will see <laughs> Again, I mean, we can bear it, but how can the president to be not being able to, like you said, communicate with the masses? Now, before I come back to that, talking about you know electioneering, how we're going to make it more transparent? I think we know, Elijah. We've overflogged this thing so much. We know what to do to make it transparent. It can never be overemphasized. Inek <laughs> knows what to do. We all know what to do. But are we willing to trade our greed, to trade our selfish interest, to trade our, you know, our self-centeredness to actually do the right thing? So nobody's willing to do that. People come in with their own personal, you know, agenda, vendetta or whatever it is. So there's no need saying, oh, let's do this to have a, a transparent and free and fair election. I mean, before I was born... People have been mentioning free and fair elections, so we know what to do. So let's not even not flog that. Let's talk about, you know, the idea. Now you asked me a question. How would you feel if I say, oh, um, Hussein, I'll leave Hussein to answer that question. And then I'm also going to leave my friend <laughs> that I brought to the studio to answer the next one. And then I'll leave the camera man to answer the next one. And then the guys in the studio back end, they should answer the final one. You know, that's just going to be a joke. So I, I pretty much think, I mean, Point blank, it's a joke. These guys think that Nigeria is a joke. And guess, I mean, it's a comedy skit. And guess who the joke is? The masses. We are oh. the joke. So if you come on a global, you know, discourse where you have an opportunity to place Nigeria on the global map, and then you're saying, uh, my friend will answer this one. I brought somebody who will answer this one. That's a joke. And I think it should be unacceptable right we should never accept it that is not the kind of polity that we want to build we must raise the bar 
if you're going to vie for the seat of the, the, uh, the presidency, you should be able to articulate the vision. You should be able to answer any question thrown at you. Do not direct it to anybody, right? You should be able to communicate to That's the basic thing because that's what you're going to be doing most of the time anyway. So when they can't communicate, I think it's a big, big red flag, big, big one. Hmm. Thank you very much, Victor. So, uh, Hussein, I was going to ask you your thoughts on the U ongoing U.S.-Africa leaders summit in America. You know, President Biden is hosting uh, 49 is specific. How many states do we have in Africa? We know we have about 50, 53 or so you get about. Okay, yeah, so, yeah. Uh, so um, 49 no, uh, is being hosted in America by, by the president of America, President Biden. And they were very intentional about choosing these 49 people. Now, where you have president of uh, Ghana, Nana Akufu Adu, he was saying something about we Africans should be more responsible and stand up to build our economy, especially mm. promoting the African continental free trade agreement. And then America is trying to see how to work with African countries and see how to say, okay, we're also going to support in establishing or enforcing or, or strengthening democratic institution in, in Africa, as opposed to China and Russia, because they feel China and Russia, according to the American, uh, the position of the American government is that China and Russia are only coming to, to come and do so, um, something that will benefit their government more than, than building institution mm -hmm. in, in Africa. But the American government don't just want to do business with African, according to them, they don't just want to do business with African uh, countries, Africa as a, country, uh, as a continent, but they also want to support the democratic institution here. So, Hussein, I want to hear your thoughts. What do you think about the ongoing African, uh, US African Leader Summit? I think President Buhari is going to meet with Joe Biden or so. Yeah, there. Okay. Thank you for wanting to hear my thoughts about the ongoing uh, American African you know, Economic Summit. See, I want to go in line of thoughts of uh, the governor, uh, the president of Ghana. Right, saying Africans should take more responsibility. The truth be told, right? When you're talking about the United States trying to build the institution, and the United States arguing how that uh, the China, the rights of China and some other countries are just selfish about building their country. The reality is both the United States and uh, China, they are all wanting to build their country and making uh, African be dependent on them, right? So what we should be looking at is uh, we should begin to take responsibility. I'll give an example. Some years back, say around 20, 2012, 2013, Gogu came to Africa and saying they want to support institution, university, gave some dollars you know, to install their, their facilities and what have you bringing Google advocates to, to ensure that they promote one or two things. But I will tell you what they did. They collected data for free. It's almost for free. That same data they collected, they're using it to generate more income and to service us back. So what they, they are, they're arguing to say they are building institutions, but today, out of the leading fintech industrial companies in, you know, in San Francisco, Google is part of it. Whose economy is he building? United States economy. So don't don't let us uh, deceive ourselves. Africa needs to take responsibility. I was opportune one time to to meet with uh, the president of Rwanda, uh, President Paul Kagame. He says, if Africans are not taking responsibility to manage their data, we will begin to export, which we are seeing in Nigeria, export our email resources. This same human resources will be exported in a cheap manner, and they will, the same refined product of our own exports will be sold to us at an expensive rate. This is what we are seeing. So Africans need to come together, all the responsibility, develop. It is only African that can develop Africa. It is only Nigerian that can develop Nigeria. We need to agree to say, this is where we are going. And this is, we, we have all this. So Nigeria, I will tell you, is the richest country in the world. A lot of things, when you go outside the country, you see that we are really enjoying because price, uh, form, form price is the cheapest in the world as far as my own exposure has been, right? I've not seen any country, even in Ghana, Nigerian fuel is cheaper 
compared to what are the pump price in Ghana, in Bene Republic and what have you. But are we taking responsibility? We are all, always shouting government, who are the government, if not us? So we need to take responsibility and stop complaining, start acting and correcting things without sentiment. So for me, it's, well, it's a new development based on uh, learning process, you know, things that you don't know before you get exposed and see. Because democracy years in Africa is, you know, is short compared to over 200 years democracy in the United States. So you need to learn as well. So I think African leaders have to be smart, learn from the process and come back to Africa and develop their own. Africa has to take responsibility. That's my own opinion. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much, Zin. You actually said what I want to hear. You know, uh, we cannot do, we cannot do without uh, learning, and also being accountable as nations uh, to other nations of interest. Of course, nobody is an island. The world has come together. The reason why I cited all these instances happening around the world, you can see that some of these things happening are kind of affecting other aspects of the world. Everybody is being affected, so nobody is living in silos. All of us are. We're all interconnected. Mm. So we have to try our best to make the world a better place, whether you're an American or a Russian or an Ukrainian. Of course, I want to appeal to the United Nations and every, every authority in the world to see how to come to the rescue of the Ukrainians and Russia to solve this problem because the, the Russia-Ukraine war is another global pandemic. You see what it has done, affected food prices, fuel, gas, and all these things. People are dying and the rest, and you no know, countries living at Asketa. If you watch the news, you will not be, you will not be happy to what you see children dying in the hospital. So let's appeal to the president of Russia to come and resolve this issue with all other re relevant authority. And also we Nigerians, we should prepare for 2023 and have our hope high. So let's conclude by commiserating with the families of the boys who we are drowned recently in the frozen Babs Mill Lake in the United Kingdom. May they are so rest in peace. Hussein Olariwaju is next after the break. Do stay with us.